Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Ariba Shabir and we have been discussing English language teaching. So far we have covered English language in India, context and prospects. We discussed about word Englishes, uh, dialects and understood how general Indian English exists in India. We also covered structures of the English language in which we broadly discussed phonology and morphology. Moreover, we discussed uh, syntax and semantics. Today we are going to cover a different session and this is entitled as Understanding Context in Learning Second Language. So dear learners, before we proceed further, let us recapitulate of what we did in the last session. In the last session, we discussed about as the syntax, which is the study of how words combine to form larger units such as phrases and sentences. We learned tree rigram and we understood how phrase structure rules work. And to understand phrase structure rules and sentences, we understood a tree diagram, which involved three steps of making it and it involves a phase structure rules looking for words and matching the lexical categories and inserting the words under the labels. In addition, we talked about the constituency tests which includes substitution test and standalone tests. We also learn about uh, language which is the system of thoughts which brings inherent connection between form and meaning. Also, we learn about semantic lexical relations which include synonymy, antonyms, hyponymy, polysemy and metonymy. Now, after uh, recapitulating of what we did in the last session, let us understand that after uh, going through the context in second language pedagogy, what are the learning outcomes. So, after this session, you will be able to develop an understanding of the essential notions of context. Moreover, you will be able to apply the framework of context to practical interactions in language teaching and learning. <clears throat> Dear learners, when we talk about context, we have to understand that while using language, we refer to a context and be it a speaking or listening, reading or writing. By context, I mean that there is a situation in which we refer to our cells and we try to locate our utterances. Not only this, we try to put our tones into the framework of the context. And it also depends on how our audience responds and that determines our language choices. So it is pretty clear that when a language is used in a context, it is likely to produce effective outcomes. And that is the reason why we always focus on contextualized approach of teaching. And it is uh, being said that if language pedagogy includes context based teaching, then learners are likely to produce better outcomes than those who do not. So, uh, while looking up to the idea of what context is, it is important to go through the definitions and the important notions which are introduced in the language teaching pedagogy. The first uh, is the first definition of context which we will look here. As uh, you can see in the slide, first says that uh, the complete meaning of a word is always contextual and no study of meaning apart from a complete context can be taken seriously. To explain you uh, this concept and of course this definition, let us take up the example of a story. And you take up a story and uh, you pick up a line from a story and without reading the entire story, you try to drive the meaning of that particular line. Then what do you think? Will you be able to justify the story or would you be able to drive conclusion? Or do you think that you will be able to bring the meaning of the line uh, effectively? 
I am sure your answer would be no. Why? Because you have not understood the factors which are responsible uh, in the story or you have not understood the context. Also you can say that you have not understood the situation which is included in the story. So therefore, you can say that while reading up the particular line, you cannot, uh, you cannot drive the meaning successfully. You may try to cover up or you may try to uncover the literal meaning, but you will somehow cover the contextual meaning of the story or you can say the contextual meaning of that particular line. And that is the reason why Firth has said that whatever is put in isolation, it should not be taken up seriously, rather the lines or the words or the sentences which are put up in context are more likely to have a better meaning and you can easily understand it. Okay, before understanding the concept of context and uh, going deep into the definitions and important notions which have been introduced by many renowned scholars, let us try to make out what context is. So, uh, uh, whenever we use language, we refer to a context. It simply means that uh, we speak, we listen, we read and write and we refer to a specific situation. Sometimes we use a tone and that tone is also identified in a context and also it happens that our audience response determines our language choices. So it makes us pretty clear about the idea that uh, whenever a language is used in context, it produces effective communication and that is the reason why we always emphasize that a teacher should use a contextualized approach in language teaching because when learners get to know how to connect one event with the other, they are likely to have a better understanding of the lessons and in the same way, they are likely to produce better outcomes. In fact, neuro-linguist programming, NLP linguists have uh, uh, conveyed that uh, uh, those uh, students who are uh, taught with context based settings are likely to produce effective outcomes. Now looking up to these uh, definitions, Firth has tried to put up uh, the concept of context and he says that the complete meaning of a word is always contextual and no study of meaning apart from a complete context can be taken seriously. In order to explain this definition, let us take up a quick example of a story. Uh, suppose you take a story and you pick any line from it, however you do not read the full story and also you do not understand its context, but you try to drive meaning of that particular line. Now my question to you is, do you think that you will be able to justify with the meaning? Or do you think that you will be able to quickly reach to conclusion or will you be able to understand what is happening in the uh, story or will you be able to understand the factors which are influencing the meaning of that particular line? I am sure your answer would be no. The reason is that when you read a uh, story from the beginning and when you read and proceed uh, uh, continuously, then you are likely to understand what context is, you are likely to understand its factors and you also comprehend the meaning in a better way. So it is pretty clear that uh, a line should not be in isolation, rather it should comprise of context and to understand the context, you should learn the factors, you should know what is happening around it and you should know what is making uh, the line uh, and you should know what is the effect of that particular line. Only then you will be able to understand the story in a better way, in an efficient way and that is the reason why Firth has said that whatever the word you hear or whatever the line or you can say sentence which you hear is primarily uh, not uh, comprehensible in isolation. If you understand words and sentences in context, you are likely to have a better understanding. Similarly, there is another co uh, concept which is quite popular and that is communicative competence. Let me tell you that the first uh, notion which was introduced was linguistic competence, but uh, communicative competence was the answer to the linguistic competence. And according to the Delhims, 
he further he says that communicative competence is a term in linguistics which refers to a language user's grammatical knowledge of syntax morphology phonology and the like as well as social knowledge about how and when to use utterances appropriately uh, before i dive into the definition of communicative competence let's quickly have a look of what linguistic competence is it is the system of linguistic knowledge which is possessed by native speakers of a language so uh, professor noam chomsky had an idea that uh, language learning in order to learn language efficiently one should have a linguistic knowledge and what linguistic knowledge uh, comprises of it takes of phonology it takes of morphology it takes a knowledge of syntax and so on so he thought that uh, these linguistic units comprise of a knowledge which is essential for language learning and for having understanding of a language use however when delhim came up with the idea of communicative competence he introduced one important concept and that is social setting or you can say social knowledge so in addition to the grammatical knowledge of syntax morphology phonology one should know the special knowledge of the social surroundings that means one should have a knowledge of uh, the utterances regarding their usages for example which utterance should be used at what particular point of time this knowledge will make uh, the speaker will make the writer will make uh, the reader understand uh, language efficiently and not only this it will enhance uh, the uh, the idea of knowledge uh, on which the uh, theories are based on coming up to the next slide we have uh, uh, tried to elaborate uh, the idea of communicative competence del hims has further clarified that what communicative competence is he says that whether and to what degree something is formally possible so it's not merely the reason of using linguistic or grammatical knowledge rather one should know to what degree words and sentences are acceptable and they are formally possible when it comes to adjusting in a situation and also he said that whether and to what degree something is feasible in virtue of the means of implementation available whether and to what degree something is appropriate or you can say is it adequate or is it adjusting with the happy surrounding or is it adjusting with the successful surrounding and whatever the relation uh, is being portrayed through the context to, uh, in which it should be used and evaluated moreover he also highlighted that whether and to what degree something is in fact done actually performed and what it entails after uh, the understanding these concepts let's also try to have a look of heliday's view heliday uh, uh, says we do not experience language in isolation but always in relation to a scenario some background of persons and actions and events from which the things which are said derive the meaning so heliday is trying to mention that uh, whatever we say we should not uh, judge those things in isolation it has some relation with a scenario some background of persons it entails the actions and it also refers to a events from which the things are being derived and let me tell you that uh, uh, it is being it was argued before that uh, when learners come into the class they come with empty mind or you can say learners mind was compared with an empty vessel however post modern uh, theorists say that a learner doesn't come empty, uh, with an empty vessel rather he or she has some context in his mind how a learner might be might have seen a movie before coming to a class or a learner might have talked to his friend before coming to the class so he or she has some background some context in which whatever is going to put in front of him is 
going to be interpreted in that way. Therefore, it is very important to understand that language whatever we speak, whatever we hear, whatever we observe are not occurring in isolation, they are coming up with a scenario and they are coming up with some background and these information gives a lot information about the listener or the reader or the viewer and also about the speaker, the writer. There is one more uh, point which Helide has uh, tried to put up his view uh, and this view is put uh, in this slide. If the observer can predict the text from the situation, then it is not surprising if the participant or interactant who has the same information available to him can drive the situation from the text. In other words, he can supply the relevant information that is lacking. So, when a person speaks in context, it is pretty clear that other uh, res that the respondents or the listeners, they, they try to fill up the gaps and also they try to respond in those situations where the speaker himself is unable to drive it. So, that is how you know a mutual understanding takes place and not just the mutual understanding, it is a rapport which takes place and this rapport essentially occurs because of the context. So, if one is lacking the other fills it up and the other is lacking the other uh, uh, you know uh, puts in. So, that is how a scenario exists, that is how a situation exists and people uh, listen to each other, react, uh, respond and uh, present their ideas, express their opinions and follow up on the basis of those opinions. That is what a context is comprised of. Now, uh, when we talk about a situation, we uh, generally refer to the context and this context of a situation comprises those features which contribute to the production and interpretation of language use. Let us take up the example of a situation where you are going to buy a ticket for uh, you are standing in a railway station and you are going to purchase a ticket, right? So, when buying a train ticket, the relevant feature of yours will be put up and uh, other features like your height, like your weight, like your family background would not be important at this particular situation. Why? Because uh, these situation is not, uh, the, these points are not required in this situation. What is required in this situation is that you need to tell which destination do you want to uh, uh, go. Also, you are supposed to uh, give your money and if there is any further inquiry with regard to the, uh, uh, with regard to the um, with regard to taking or uh, giving money. Also, you can talk about uh, uh, the travelers who are going to accompany you. For example, uh, you can talk about a person who is elderly plus. So, you may give the detail because, uh, because there would be a concession for that person or if a child is traveling with you, then also you are going to provide a detail. So, these would be essential details, these would comprise context. What would be out of the context is the height, weight, family background, your business, your job and so on. So, these things will not include in context. What context is that you talk about the details which are required for the purchase of ticket. For, for, for giving money, for taking back money, for talking about change, for talking about the number of travelers, for, uh, telling about the uh, for telling about the destination where you want to get down and so on. So, these conversations are going to be very concise and would be dependent upon the crux of the content. Also, we talk about relevance when we discuss uh, context because relevance makes possible for the participants to identify those features of the situation that come into play when they make sense of a situation and use language in accordance with the requirements of the particular situation. Now, 
in the example that I guess just gave you that you are the customer and you are going to purchase a ticket. Let me tell you that uh, when you are buying a ticket, there would be a huge queue behind you, right? So, do you think that you will keep on chatting with the persons, with the individuals who are standing behind to you or do you think that you will try to uh, entertain yourself through a video or you will watch movie? No. At that point of time, you will be very focused and you will only have a goal of taking a ticket. Therefore, the relevance is about uh, the features which come into play which makes sense and which is in accordance with the requirements. So, you need to have your money ready, you need to be attentive throughout and uh, you need to look up at the window and you have to tell your details uh, accurately so that the relevance does not compromise. Then there is another important topic which is schema. Schema is, uh, is emphasized especially when we talk about context and why because schema tells us that the notion uh, of uh, uh, schemas refers to uh, cognitive aspects of learning. Schemas are mental models or frameworks which organize information in the mind and represent generalized knowledge about events, situations, objects, actions and feelings. So, as the discussion demonstrates that context is very abstract, right? And uh, it is a mental concept, it is a mental concept concept because uh, whatever is being understood and whatever is being taken up is always referred to a background knowledge of uh, the user. When we talk about context, we say that it is abstract notion and it is an aspect of cognitive learning. Why? Because learners uh, already have a background knowledge and whatever we speak, they take reference from their background knowledge and then they uh, interpret it. So, uh, you can say that in the train ticket situation which we discussed, which we uh, discussed uh, in the last slide. The customer can buy the, to, uh, buy the ticket only if they recognize and identify the surroundings as an instance of buying a ticket situation. In other words, you can say that if the abstract schema what buying a train ticket normally entails, so even if the immediate surroundings are you know physical or concrete, they make sense if the customer can relate them with their background knowledge or their abstract schema of the particular social activity. So, they take the schema or they take their background knowledge as a reference points and whatever comes in front of them, they first try to relate it with the uh, already existing knowledge and then they refer to it, provided that the environment is concrete and abstract. Now, we have uh, another uh, notion of trichotomies and context as a social construct consisting of the knowledge of conventions that govern communication practices within a group is accessible to members of the community. As a consequence, the analyst as a member of the community has first hand insight into the group's social practices and can utilize the first person introspection or observation. To make you this concept uh, uh, clearer, let us try to take up a situation where you are sitting with your friends and you have been discussing on let us say environment and your discussion has taken it 
has taken forward by your group members and in the meantime you see that uh, a friend has come late and has tried to join in your discussion. So, you know whatever the discussion has taken place would be uh, largely understood by the people who are already discussing or who have already been taken this discussion forward. The person who has come later or who has tried to join the conversation later would find difficulty or would not be able to find the track of the conversation that is already going on. So, that is how what context is that in order to understand uh, what conversation is going on, what are the things that have been discussed, what are the um, uh, outcomes that have been res uh, that have been understood or have been discussed. It is important for the person to realize the context, to, uh, to go through, to understand the role of the each member, to identify who has taken up and what is the goal of this conversation. So, there would be lot of things which a person who has come late needs to know. Right. So, that is the reason why we say that anybody can not join any time rather one has to look up for the context which is already go, going on and the context is uh, provided in a situation and the situation gives them chances to, uh, to take up on. So, dear learners when we talk about a speech act theory, uh, we refer largely on context, we also think of words which uh, we also think of words and sentences which, which are not merely the words or sentences which talks about the action to be taken or which encourages action to be taken right after it. So, uh, let us try to look up at these uh, words which are being presented in this slide. What is a speech act and what this theory is trying to convey? That the speech act theory considers language as a sort of action. Now, here action is the key word. Uh, so, the speech act theory considers language as a sort of action rather than a medium to convey and express. The speech act theory was developed by J. L. Austin. He introduced this theory in 1975 in his well known book of how to do things with words. Later John Searle brought the aspects of the theory into much higher uh, dimensions. So, speech act theory is basically about the action or uh, it is not just that the medium it that conveys and express, but also uh, how an utterance leads to an action. Speech act theory is further categorized into elocutionary, uh, uh, if, is being categorized into locutionary, elocutionary and perlocutionary. These three concepts are very important and interesting to note. So, let us first try to go through the locutionary act. Locutionary is an act of making an expressive meaning. It, uh, it, is an, it is like extending the spoken language preceded by silence and then followed by silence or change of speaker also known as locution or an utterance act. Right, locutionary acts can be discussed into two parts. Uh, first is the utterance acts, as as I just mentioned, and the another one is the propositional acts. An utterance is a language that comprises of the verbal employment of units of expression, such as words such as sentences, right. And prep prepositional acts are clearer and expressive with a scientific or you can say with a specific definable point as opposed to a mere utterances acts, right. And uh, they uh, may be meaningless sounds. For example, if you take up just uh, the locutionary uh, act you can say the dog is on the floor it 
it, it denotes a statement. If I say do you want to have a coffee or do you want some coffee, it is an interrogative sentence and it is used to ask questions. Similarly, you can say close the door. Uh, it is an imperative sentence and it is also used to give direction or you can say it is cold here. So, it is a declarative sentence. So, these are the examples of locutionary act. Now, the next thing is elocutionary. What do you think of elocutionary act is? It is in simple terms. It is an action by taken by a speaker for speaking certain words. For example, actions that is promising or convincing. So, elocutionary acts, uh, let me write it over here, promising or you can say convincing, right. So, in a, as a elocutionary acts of a language is, uh, is, is, is that act in which a person is said to be doing something such as a stating or denying or asking or promising or convincing. In an elocutionary act, it is not just the act of saying something, but the act of saying with the purpose of stating an opinion or promising or confirming or denying something. You can also say that an elocutionary act is uh, done for the purpose of making a promise, a request or issuing an order or a decision or giving uh, an advice or uh, a permission. And if I have to give you the example of elocutionary acts, I can say that you can use I promise you to pay back. I promise you to pay back. It is an elocutionary act uh, because it is communicating the promise. Or you can say there is too much homework in this subject. So, that would come under the label of opinion. You can say I will do my homework later. So, in that case it would be a promise, right? Or you say go and do your homework. So, it would be like an order. So, therefore, elocutionary is an action taken by a speaker for speaking certain words and these actions comprises of promise, conveyance, order and so on. Now, there is one more concept which is perlocutionary. Perlocutionary act is an interesting one because uh, it is a, it's a, it's naming an action or state of a mind which brought about or as a result to say something. It is also uh, the result of listening to the hearer when the speaker intends to follow what he is saying. For example, you can persuade, you can convince, you can enlighten, you can inspire. Uh, examples of perlocutionary act would include that would you, would you, would you close the, uh, would you close the, the door. So, at one point if you look up at this sentence, you will find that would you close the door uh, is a, is, is a question and it asks the listener to think uh, if it is possible to close the door or not. But at the same time you see that there is a slight difference when it comes to the meaning of it or you can say there is a slight difference when it comes to the intention of uh, this uh, question. It is basically a request, would you close the door? Similarly, you can use other examples like uh, could you please bring me a glass of water? So, uh, it's, it may be asking a question, it may be just like that, is it feasible for you to bring a glass of water, but in reality or if you deeply analyze its context, you will understand that it is not a question, rather it is about a request and you are, uh, uh, in you are supposed to bring the glass of water right after listening this request. So, that is what perlocutionary uh, thing works.
uh, when we talk about speech acts, we also refer to some uh, indirect speech acts. This is very interesting one. You do not directly say to the listener that you are supposed to bring something for you or you do not ask any favor. Rather, you say indirectly and out of that indirect utterance uh, listener or the uh, viewer is uh, uh, asked uh, to do something. So, quickly let us take an example you can say I am feeling cold. Now, after looking up at this sentence uh, you will immediately go and close the window or you will uh, be directed to do something which will help me to feel cold less, right. So, if the window or if the door is uh, open and after listening this utterance, you uh, will automatically get the idea to close the door and the window. So, you need to uh, understand here that not all the utterances are spoken directly but there are some utterances which are coming under the category of uh, indirect speech acts. So, I am feeling cold or you can say I am thirsty. Basically, you are expressing yourself, you are expressing your, uh, your uh, you can say you are trying to express yourself. But what is happening over here is that uh, in addition to your expression, it is uh, it is persuading the listener to do something for you, right? And that is what the concept of indirect speech acts is. You can say that request is performed indirectly and in a more indirect way. And uh, this, these kind of sentences when you use in real life situation make the other person uh, realize that he or she should do something to make the uh, situation uh, comfortable. Now, in the uh, same way, we talk about cooperative principle, we understood what speech act theory is. Now, let us look up at the cooperative principle, it is in linguistics, it describes how people achieve uh, effective conversational communication, effective communication. Now, this is the key word in the, uh, uh, in the cooperative principle which was given by Paul Kreese and it was introduced uh, in the concept of pragmatic theory and uh, it says that uh, people achieve effective communication in common so social situations, common social situations. Right, and that is how listeners and speakers act cooperatively and mutually accept one another to be understood in a particular way. So, uh, Paul Grease who once mentioned that make your contribution uh, such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged unquote. So, this was uh, uh, given by Grease in which he wanted to say that your contribution should be uh, should be should be uh, in such a way that it should accept the purpose or it should direct the communication which is taking place among your peer members so that they can understand and they take it forward and then you reach the goal right accordingly the cooperative principle is divided into four maxims of conversation and these are maxim of quantity maxim of quality um, maxim of relation and there is one more which is maxim of manner. So, as I just talked about uh, the maxims which were given by uh, Paul Grease in the cooperative principle, 
let us try to understand in detail about the number of maxims that are being presented as maxims of quantity, maxims of quality, manner and relation. So, the first one is the maxim of quantity. Now, in the maxim of quantity, we generally refer to the content length and depth. It simply means that the maxim of quantity is to be informative. information and it should be informative enough. So, uh, what you can drive from the entire uh, maximum of uh, quantity is that you should make your contribution as informative as it is required that is for the purpose of the exchange. And also what uh, Greece has tried to mention in this is that do not make your contribution more information more informative than it is required. So, this is the analogy which is used by Greece and it is it, it refers to how much the length and the depth you should take into the consideration while exchanging information with the peer members. Now, the second one is the maxim of quality. Maxim of quality is an interesting one and in simple terms it talks about the truth, right and uh, its quality should be truthful. So, you can say that one should make contribution in a way that uh, promotes truth or one's utterance should be evidence based. So, do not say what you believe is false and also do not say for which you lack uh, adequate uh, evidence, right. So, contribution that uh, is tr that, that promotes truth and also which is uh, which, which is which consists of evidences. Now, the next one is the maxim of a relation which is also interesting and it promotes us to understand how uh, one should cooperate and one should uh, communicate within a group and make uh, that setting and context more comfortable. So, relation is referring to the relevance when I say maximum of quantity, quality and then there is another concept that is maximum of relation. So, relation refers to relevance, right. So, be relevant, one should ensure that all the information that is relevant to the current exchange, therefore, uh, omit which is irrelevant. Uh, and speak what is important and which uh, information is required at the particular point of time. So, that is what the relation entails and there is one more important maxim which is being put up by Greece and he says maxim of manner. Now, this is an interesting one as it tells us to remain clear or you can say it promotes clarity in a group, right. So, in simple terms the maxim of manner is to remain clear, uh, whereas the previous maxims are primarily concerned with what is said, the maxims of the maxim of manner is connected with how and what is said is set. So, you need to be uh, 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 perspicuous. So, for uh, in, a, in order to attain the maxim of manner, you need to keep in mind certain things and these things are being proposed by Paul Greece. He says that you should avoid obscurity of expression. Let me write it down over here, obscurity of expression 
Now what is obscurity? It means you should avoid language which is difficult to understand. So avoid language which is difficult to understand. Now you need to understand what should be the age of the audience or what should be the age of the people who are contributing in your communication, what is their background, what is their educational qualification and uh, what is their uh, convenience with regard to the topic that you are discussing. So if you come up with technical words which other people are finding difficult to, to understand or if you belong to a certain profession and you are using those words which are not comprehensible to the other speakers or to the other members of your communication group then they are likely to less understand you. Right, so uh, the effectivity of communication would not take place. That is the reason why we say that before presenting your ideas or before communicating among yourselves, you need to consider the audience or the viewers background with respect to their age, with respect to their background in terms of their educational qualification and of course their profession. So a person who comes from a science background would not be as comprehensible to the business person because he uses jargons, because he uses registers. So by jargons and registers I mean that he or she uses technical words and therefore similarly a business student would not be comprehensible to the arts student if he or she uses the words which are technical to his field. Therefore one should know that what kind of words uh, should be used so that uh, the communication takes place effectively and all the members of the group cooperate to make the goal successful. Uh, one more thing which Paul Grease has mentioned is to avoid ambiguity. Now what is ambiguity as I told you in the uh, last session uh, when we were discussing syntax and semantics, ambiguity occurs at word level and it also occurs at sentence level. So to give you a glimpse, uh, uh, ambiguity uh, would refer to the meaning, would refer to a word which has two or more than two meanings. Similarly, a sentence which is not clear and it may er give rise to different interpretations. So for that matter, you need to be quite precise and clear and clarify if you think that you have used an ambiguous sentence so that uh, uh, your uh, ease of communication uh, becomes better. Right, then also uh, in manner of, uh, in, in maxim of manner, Paul Grease talked about be brief. Okay. What is be brief? It means avoid unnecessary, prolox, uh, pro, uh, uh, unnecessary prolox, uh, prolixity. Prolixity uh, here I mean that you should avoid the information which is not useful or you can say which does not fall into your context, which does not fall into uh, the uh, situation in which you are passing through or which is not really concerning with the team members who have been discussing uh, a topic or who have been uh, trying to put up your views or following your views. So uh, you know in order to make the conversation precise, clear and optimistic, you need to take care of avoiding redundancy. Uh, redundancy is, you, is uh, redundancy occurs when you speak something which is extra or something which is repetitive, something which uh, is not required and which you have already spoken. So you know these things become, uh, uh, become extra and uh, viewers may not take you then seriously if it persists. So you need to take up uh, certain things about your briefness that your articulation, your word choices and your sentences become concise and they should avoid redundant uh, expressions. Then there is uh, one more point which is important to mention here is uh, be orderly. 
Now, as the word indicates orderly, it refers to sequence, it refers to going step by step. You cannot put any point at any juncture. You need to think that which point should be taken up uh, initially and which point should be taken up at a later stage uh, such that it becomes comprehensible and easy to understand by your group members and you need to first brainstorm then you need to introduce then you need to add some details you may take up some statistical details you can add some rhetoric details then you can conclude that's how you proceed with the content it is not like that you come and uh, put up any point without even introducing or without making the base or the foundation so it is likely to produce less effectiveness if you go through the order then uh, the information which is provided will make sense and it will be easy for the recipient to process in his or her mind. So now we will discuss relevance theory because when we go into uh, because when we dive into context we talk about the relevance and if you are uh, if you are understanding these concepts deeply I am sure you have understood the idea of what relevance is and how relevance is important in a conversation. So this is a uh, this is an important uh, theory which was given by Dan Sperber and uh, it was presented with Theodore Wilson. So relevance theory is a framework of the utterances which is interpreted or you can say it is a framework for understanding the interpretation of utterances. So, interpretation as seems a very interesting concept because to you uh, something appears 6 but for me it appears 9. You know for everybody a uh, situation and uh, the context remains different especially uh, when we talk about the interpretation we interpret our utterances in a different way the other person interpret in a different way. So that is where the interpretation uh, starts taking its value. Therefore, if we look up at this slide I am writing over here is the, uh, 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 here that uh, this theory uh, basically it says that every utterance conveys the information. And that is relevant enough for it to be worth the addressee's effort to process it. That is if I say something to you, you can safely assume that I believe that the conveyed information is worthwhile and your effort to listen to and to comprehend it. And also that it is the most relevant one, compatible one with the, your preferences and abilities. So I try to make the utterance as easy. Uh, as possible uh, to give you information uh, about the content and to make uh, the communication easy and to the point. So other key ingredients of relevance theory is that it uh, the that the uh, utterances are ostensive, ostensive. Now. And ostensive here refers to that they draw their addressees attention to the fact that the communicator wants to convey some information and also inferential it simply means that the addressee has to infer has to understand on the basis of the context that what the communicator wants to convey based on the utterances literal and referential meaning along with the addressees real knowledge of uh, the surroundings and of course sensory input and other information. So inferences uh, or you can say inferential is something which is important and it is intended by the communicator as it implies explicators and implicators. Explicators and implicators. Uh, the explicators of an utterance are what is explicitly said.
often supplemented with contextual information um, and uh, implicators implicators are conveyed without actually referring to the context. So, you can say that uh, relevance theory is about the explicitly uh, conveying the information and also implicitly conveying the information. And it also attempts to explain figurative languages. Uh, for example, hyperbole or you can say metaphor and irony. So, these are the important things which tells us or which determines our context and it uh, drives meaning basically leads us to a conclusion or it helps us to focus our goals. So, uh, relevance theory although was opposed by many of these scholars, but it uh, stands on its substantial reasons that uh, uh, it uh, conveys the information that is relevant enough to be understood and it primarily focuses on interpretation and that interpretation uh, is important for any uh, speaker or any writer to uh, express in language. So, I think this is uh, sufficient to understand what context is and what theories are included in, uh, uh, in, in the understanding of context. We have also gone through some important uh, pragmatic theories like uh, speech act theory, like we talked about the maxims, cooperative principle which was given by Christ, Greece and also we uh, talked about the Delhim's communicative competence which is prevalent and which is being talked widely in the pedagogy of language learning. We also understood the relevance theory. Now, try let us try to understand what have we concluded from the discussion. Context represent those features of a situation that pertain to the understanding and creation of meaning in an act of communication and come about as a result of the human agent's interaction with their environment. So, it is a if we uh, if I have to highlight the keywords here so that you can make reference of the context that we have put up in is the situation that pertain to the understanding and creation of meaning in an act of communication and come about as a result of the humans agent human agents interaction with their environment. So, situation, understanding, creation, meaning, communication, interaction and more importantly environment is something which we need to understand while looking up into context. As discussed in that discussion, context is a schematic uh, construct which comprises language users knowledge about the world in general and about how to communicate in particular. So, a learner has a background knowledge and he or she uses that background knowledge as reference points and whatever the information is presented to him or her, uh, he is likely to refer to from it and uh, interpret in a way. Similarly, we discussed about the theories that reveal how language is experienced by the insider participants and how they make meaning in events. We also uh, understood that the way the relationship between context and language is seen varies depending upon the particular focus and purpose of communication. So, with this we have uh, come to an end, these are the references and uh, I am sure you have got a deep understanding of what context is and how we use context in second language learning. Before I conclude, let me tell you that in second language learning pedagogy, there has been a lot of debate of using context based approaches and context based uh, materials. So, it has been understood from the wide researches which has, uh, which have been taken place 
And uh, these researcher, researchers have concluded that if we use context in our language settings, especially to the learners who have been trying to uh, understand language and use language in a context, then uh, context based settings are important and they will uh, and it is it is likely to give better results than those uh, uh, pedagogies which do not use context based approaches. So, with this we have come to an end, thank you very much for joining.